and then I'm gonna um, I'm gonna post the uh, video on my YouTube channel, and I'll send you the link to my YouTube channel. If that's okay with everybody. Woo, I'm yeah, it sounds good. good. All right. I mean, that's 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 the way we have an easy link, and I think this 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 video will be helpful for um, a lot of reasons. All right. So what I'm going to do, well, first off, before I share my screen. I'm going to close out what I was doing, and we're going to start with uh, a blank slate. Uh, so just give me a second to clean off my. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, okay, um, and. So I gave you guys open wind for school. Oh, actually, um, Eric might not know where this is. So in our shared drive, so um, we have a, um, a wind energy team shared drive, which if you don't have access to Eric uh, Garfield, make sure Eric has access to this. Our shared drive. I have access to it. Okay, and we have um, uh, sub teams with the project development sub team. I'm going to our 21, 2022, and I loaded a folder called Open Wind for Schools. And my suggestion is, is you download that entire folder onto your hard drive. Now, Garfield, you probably did this the other day. I discovered since then when I was practicing going through this tutorial that some of the files I gave you, um, particularly in this basic folder, um, I had apparently worked through part of the tutorial and then I accidentally saved my work so that these files weren't, they weren't the version files that I expected them to be and like some had work since then. So I just found my clean version of Open Wind for Schools without anyone having started it yet. And I re, I, I, I deleted the, I deleted the basic folder and the intermediate folder that I had uploaded yesterday or on the 8th. And I uploaded the, the new, new versions of these two folders. Okay. So these have the untouched as if you're just starting the tutorial. Um, just started the tutorials. So if you've already downloaded these, delete what you got, these two folders, you've already downloaded it and, and download these two folders. Um, all right, now I've already downloaded these folders. I've already downloaded the whole Open Wind for Schools. And we, when you, if you download the Open Wind for Schools um, folder, inside the folder, you have all these subfolders and there's two files you need to pay attention to. The first file, is um, this open wind lesson plan. Now, so this is open wind for schools and I should probably explain, open wind is a professional software application that costs several thousand dollars to get a license to. Um, we can, if we decide to use open wind for the competition, we can get an academic license that's like just for the year. But right now I have open wind for schools. It is the full version of open wind, but it's geographically limited in that it only allows me to work in a certain region of Nova Scotia as like a demo era area. Okay. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open up this open wind lesson plan. And um, and so this is the I am basically going to walk you through the first third of this lesson plan. That's the demo I'm going the demo tutorial I'm going to go through today. You can go through it yourself in more detail later because you have the PDF here that takes you step by step um, what, what you want to do. Okay, and I'm gonna, what I'm gonna try to do is work as best I can with having the instructions open and having the app open at the same time. The app itself is called Open Wind Demo. It's an executable. You don't need to install it on your computer. You just need to launch it. And it little dialogue box that will tell you that this is a demonstration um, and that it's limited in geographic scope and most of the import functions have been removed. Okay, so um, 
I'm going to try to work like this, where I have the PDF open on one side and the, oops, what am I doing? And the um, app open on the other um, on the other side of one window. So right now, can you guys see both the app and the PDF? Yes. Okay. Um, and now I've got like the the uh, um, the Zoom controls were in my way, so I had to move them out of my way. All right. Um, so when you open Open Wind for schools, it's going to look like this, and this is Open Wind. And Open Wind is an example of GIS software. Um, we were talking about GIS software the other day. GIS stands for uh, Geographic Information Systems, um, and GIS is something that you could get. You could get a four-year college degree in studying GIS. Uh, it's a really big topic. Um, all GIS software works pretty much the same way. And so by getting an introduction to how open wind works, you're also kind of getting, it'll help you get a sense for how software apps like QGIS works, ArcGIS works. And also if we decide to use um, a Furrow for our project development software, Furrow, I think from what I can see works very similarly. Um, there is, a general area like this is where uh, this is my main window where I'll probably be doing most of my work and we'll see maps and we'll see layers uh, appear in this window. Uh, this is kind of like this is like where we'll kind of see like a, a tree hierarchy structure for various layers. And then, of course, like most applications, we have, you know, a toolbar and we have a menu bar and some of this will make sense. Um, once I start, I import some uh, data. So I'm gonna go and just work through this tutorial. Um, I'm gonna ignore the introduction for now, although you might wanna read the introduction later. Um, and I'm just gonna start with this open uh, introductory lesson plan, which first tells me to open up the software that I've already opened. And then I'm gonna open up this first uh, basic um, file, which is called Nova Scotia One. So I'm going to go to File, Open, and in, inside my basic folder, I'm going to open up Nova Scotia 1. Okay. Um, and this is somewhat unfortunate in the fact that uh, the way this tutorial system works, it's got, it, 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 this lesson plan works, is it starts with all of this data and all of this information already loaded into OpenWind, where, as I was discussing the other day, uh, some of the, the parts that confuses me most about, um, what confuses me most about GIS software is how to get the data into GIS software. Because there seems to be an awful lot of file formats an awful lot of different ways of bringing in data. Um, I should probably, uh, point out where we're working. So this is Nova Scotia. Um, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to open up um, this Google Maps real quick. And that's us. And where we're looking at is this region right here, okay? So uh, we're, that map that you just saw, we're looking at essentially this, this little, I don't know what we call it an isthmus or this little, this little tract of land, okay? Um, at least I think that's where we're looking at. Looks a little different to me. Maybe um no, well let's 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 just assume we're working on this track of land. All right. So um the way GIS work, software works in general is you have layers and each layer can represent something different. Um so right now we're looking at I'm gonna um
to uh, remove some of these layers so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. So um, I'll explain what this, these met masks are in a little bit, but I have various layers where one layer might represent um, information that's telling me about the elevation of land masses. Um, this layer is telling me, uh, has embedded in it some information about the vegetation height. Um, this layer represents um, something that's important in wind energy harvesting and, 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 wind, and, and understanding wind maps, uh, uh, surface roughness. Um, these, as you can tell from the name, are various MET masks. MET mast is short for meteorological mass. These, are, these represent very tall towers uh, that can be uh, typically like uh, 90 meters tall, where there have been anemometers placed on them. And over the course of the year, they've collected wind speed data and temperature data and pressure data and air density data over the course of the year and have created a time series at various heights along the Met mass, um, usually things like thir at 30 meters, 40 meters, 60 meters, 90 meters, or 100 meters. Um, what is the wind speed? What is the wind direction? What is the air temperature? What is the air density? And what is the air pressure? Um, at something like they, they'll take a measurement every 15 minutes and they'll do that for a year. Okay. So these are points in space that represent at this point in space or this point on the map, we know what a typical annual wind speed data is on as you know at, at any given moment in time, right? Or like at every 15 minutes, and then we can interpolate or between um, 15 minutes. Um, but it's only at these locations do we actually know the wind speed. And one of the things the software is going to do for us is it's going to predict what the wind speed and wind direction is um, everywhere in the map based on knowledge of where the wind, what the wind speed is at this point in the map. Um, so we can also get information like where are wetlands. So this is like just an indication, is this area a wetland or it's not? You can see it coming on and off as I turn off. Uh, here we have uh, water bodies, water courses, and as you can see, like, okay, the rivers get added when I click on it, you can make it visible. We also have information about where transmission lines are or transmission stations, uh, different types of vegetation, where there are trails, where there are roads, where there are local roads. Um, we can get contour information. We can also get the location of it's a little subtle. You can see the buildings being added or not added here, where there are buildings, where there are domiciles, where people live. Okay. So you can have all kinds of different information, depending on what type of GIS software, what you're trying to do, you load in different layers that have different information. Um, and um, as I've already indicated in the software, I can make my layers visible or invisible simply by clicking on this icon and, and adding this check mark or not having this check mark. Um, I have this this view window. I can control it pretty much the same way I control most window uh, applications. Um, I can use my scroll bar, my, my scroll bar in the middle of my scroll wheel in the middle of the mouse. I can zoom in and I can zoom out. I can left click and drag. Um, that is like right now on the toolbar, kind of by default, I have this pan selected. And so that means that I can click and I can drag, I can zoom in, I can zoom out. I can also select a particular area I want to highlight by clicking on the uh, magnifying glass icon and clicking and dragging and zooming in to like this one particular section. Um, if I want to see the whole map, I can click this icon and that'll essentially show me like everywhere where I have some information, it'll um, zoom out to control that. Um, also, what might be important is um, this icon, which is the info icon, and this is the edit icon, or the, I should say the info tool and the edit tool. Um, let me 
demonstrate to you how some of this works. Um, suppose I was interested in, oops. I wanted to know the elevation at some particular point. Um, if I have this info icon selected um, and I highlight a layer, let's say elevation, that has um, that has like information everywhere. As I move this cursor around, you have to look. You have to look here. Um, as I move my cursor around, I'm seeing my change in coordinates here. If I have this information tool selected in this box here, I will see what the value of this layer is um, at any point inside the map. And as you see, I'm seeing numbers change that represent elevation because I have the elevation tab selected. Uh, or the elevation layer selected, I should say. Um, I, I'm seeing different uh, values of elevation. Okay. Um, and the edit tool, we'll get to the edit tool in a little bit, but obviously if I'm gonna make, if I'm gonna change things, I'm gonna edit things, uh, that's where I use the edit tool. Okay, um, I just wanna make sure that I'm not, I'm kind of, going through this, I'm not reading the tutorial, I'm just kind of going through it by memory. Um, okay, yes, yeah, so here's it. All right, um, so I'm gonna select, one of the things um, I was trying to explain the other day when we were messing around with QGIS is I bring in a layer, if I bring in a layer as what's called rasterized data, which is essentially I bring in an image and that image is just a color image that has a bunch of different colors on it. Your GIS software doesn't know what those colors represent yet. So when you select, click on one of these layers, um, if you right click on a layer, a, a context sensitive menu will open up and what types of that, what, what options you have are gonna be dependent on what type of layer it is. Um, Probably the most important thing in this menu for our purposes is selecting properties. And so inside properties, I can change, I can control a lot of things about the layer. Uh, things as simple as like, what is its opacity? So I can make it very opaque. So it's the only thing that shows up on the screen or I can make it um, very not opaque or very um, translucent or almost transparent. Um, so I can see through the layer. Um, what I'm going to bring our attention to now is um, first I'm going to go to interpretation. And right now, even though the layer is called elevation, because when somebody brought this layer in, they called it the elevation layer. They didn't name it elevation. Uh, Open Wind doesn't understand at this point that this represents elevation. So before I can do anything, I need to tell Open Wind that this particular layer represents um, terrain elevation. Just want to make sure that's yeah, terrain elevation. Um, also, I'm going to because this tutorial tells me to. Um, in this case, I'm going to tell it uh, elevation doesn't really make any sense for negative values. Actually, it does if you're measuring elevations by sea level. Um, but we're going to uh, uh, set this so it's not going to display values less than zero. Okay. Um, now, the cool thing about this tutorial session is um, I can work through it um, and just completely, you know, continuously uh, work through the tutorial and just make sure I don't make any mistakes as I go. Um, or if you get confused and there's one particular step, I don't, it's not, doesn't seem to be doing what I think it's supposed to be doing. And I don't really care about this particular point. I'm just trying to get the general gist of how the software works. It always gives you the option of going, working through a, a, a several steps, and then you can save what you've done. If you do decide to save, 
I strongly encourage you don't say, give it a new name. I'm going to save this as um, not going to save it in here. I'm going to like just create like a, a, a new folder. Uh, or practice. And I'll call this uh, Nova Scotia. I'm not sure if that's how you spell Nova Scotia. Uh, um, and I'm going to call it zero 02 because I'm at the point of, oh, so right here is how you spell Nova Scotia. Um, so I'm basically at the point now where I'm, I'm going to start um, step two. And it, it does this every few pages in the tutorial. So if you don't trust yourself or you think, oh, maybe, gee, maybe I made a mistake. Or if the end of step, say, four, uh, it, it has you do a calculation that's actually going to take your computer a long time, you can just skip to step, you can just open up Nova Scotia 5, and that calculation step will have already been done for you. Okay. Um, so in this case, I don't think I've done anything wrong yet. So I'm just going to go ahead and actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to... Um, just to show you how this works, I'm going to go ahead and uh, go back and I'm going to just open up Nova Scotia 2. And Nova Scotia 2, the file looks, it should look basically the same as what I've already done, except, um, in fact, and I go to elevation, this elevation, and I go to properties, I should see that in here. Yes, do not display values has already been set to zero and uh, terrain elevation has already been set as to what it's to be interpreted. So all the steps that it told me to do in, um, while I was working through Nova Scotia 1 have been done for me. Okay, So I can either continue working or I can just open up Nova Scotia 2. Okay. Um, all that was considered the introductory, uh, introductory lesson. So we've, you've now successfully worked through an introductory lesson. Um, all right, so um, now what we want to do is we want to create, um, we're going to create a new wind map layer, okay? Um, and so we're going to create our own layer. And like I said, right now, open wind only knows the location of, of it only knows the wind speed at like four or five points where these met masks are. So um, what we're going to do is I'm going to right click in this white area and I'm going to select new layer and I'm going to select um, I'm going to select uh, wind map here it is and it's going to create and now just notice I have this folder called uh, new wind map layer. Um, now it then tells me to expand my met mass layer, but I've already done that. So I have this various met mass layer. layer. Um, and um, in order for the wind map to have access to a met mass, the met mass layer has to be a child layer of the new wind map layer. And you can see there's this hierarchy of layers where you can have various, oh, we just lost Eric. Garfield, should I should I keep going? Yeah, I mean we're recording it, so might as well okay. keep going. Okay. Uh, I am recording it, right? We're. I really hope I'm recording it. I click the recording consent button, so it should be recording. Yeah, it's recording. I see it on the top left. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 All right. All right. All right. Um. Sure. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do, rather than move, uh, it's telling me I've got this north, it, it wants me to, um, say this, um, yeah, 
Okay, I'm going to take the northeast met mass and then select copy. So northeast met mass, and then I'm going to select copy, and that'll create a new northeast mass. Northeast mast. And I'm going to move this and just wait that it's highlighted here. So now the northeast mast is a child of my new wind map. Um, now, in order to calculate the wind speed at all the locations um, in some area near this met mast, uh, it needs to know some information. One of the things that it needs to know the elevation of the land. Um, near the met mass. And that's the, that's like the main thing that the model is going to use to find what is the typical wind speeds uh, in this terrain is as the terrain, there's a, there's a lot of various theories um, and, and experimental data we have on how uh, the shape of terrain affects wind speeds. Um, also, it's been shown that uh, the, your surface roughness whether your land is an asphalt, is a you know asphalt parking lot, or if it's a, a forest, uh, which is considered very rough because of various tree heights, um, all this, all of these things, so elevation, roughness, and vegetation height all play a role in um, calculating uh, wind speeds uh, based on wind speed data of a, at, just at one location. So. The tutorial is asking me to copy and paste or, or to uh, move all of these layers, elevation, roughness, and vegetation height, to be children of uh, my uh, wind map layer. Okay. And again, after doing this, after just a few steps, there's a save point. It's telling me I should save what I'm doing. Or if I want, I can just open up Nova Scotia 3, which is already these steps have been done for me. Okay. Uh, I'm going to just go ahead and keep working. Um, and it then tells me that I should, with the new map layer selected, um, I should select um, calculate. Now, when I select calculate, what it's now done is if I move my cursor in here, you'll notice that my cursor has changed to kind of like a drag box. And I can, I can drag my cursor to create a, a, a square or a rectangle where it's now going to attempt to calculate the wind speeds, um, it's, it's calculate the wind speeds everywhere within that, um, that rectangle. Um, before it does that, it opens up this uh, dialog box where I can fine tune some of the uh, I can fine tune some of the information that um, uh, um, about my rectangle. So if I could just essentially use that uh, dragging the rectangle to get like a general sense of of where um, I want it to calculate, and then I can actually more finely tune. Uh, I'm going to try to follow exactly what they did. So I'm just copying uh, data from and um, and, and some of these things, what, 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 these values mean that I'm typing in. Uh, these are just these are the coordinates now of the uh, the left side and the bottom of, or essentially the south and the west coordinates um, of my rectangle. And then I'm telling it uh, spacing nodes. I'm telling it uh, how big each node is to like essentially this is going to set how big the rectangle is. Um, and when you read through here, you'll get some of this uh, these details. Um, I'm also going to select, I can select up to eight different hub heights where I can calculate basically wind speed is dependent on how far off the ground you are. Generally speaking, the further you are from the ground, uh, the higher the wind speeds. So I'm going to select um, four different hub heights. I could select up to eight different hub heights. Um, and um, I'm selecting up to, uh, but I'm going to select four different hub heights. 
Um, and so it's going to predict, it's going to attempt to calculate what the wind speed is at this various hub heights. Okay, let's see if I did everything correctly. Um, now you'll see here on a particularly slow computer uh, or time to go from doing feed has become very choppy. My video, you're really hearing me? No, your audio is fine. All right, I'm having difficulty hearing you that <laughs> the fact that I'm doing this is slow. A couple minutes. Um, again, slow computer. Uh, I could just go ahead and because I'm working the tutorial, I could go ahead and hit cancel and then just open up Nova Scotia 4. Which I think I'm going to do. So I just opened up Nova Scotia 4, which, and if the audio was bad, I don't know if the audio on the recording was bad or not. I'm guessing it was. Um, but uh, it takes a few minutes to calculate, to find the, to determine these wind maps. It, it, it's quite computationally expensive. Um, it really only takes a couple of minutes on my computer. Uh, this is a fairly powerful laptop, although it is five years old. Um, but now that I have that done, two more inside my new wind map layer, two more uh, two more layers have appeared. They're both called wind speed. Um, and what I'm going to do so you can see what these wind speeds are is I'm going to turn off most of these other layers. Okay, so um, I think all I have, I have the Met masks up and I have, um, and I have one of the two wind speed maps set. Now, um, if I go to my um, info, um, as I move around, you can see Oh, I've got vegetation. Okay. Um, with wind speed selected, you can now see in my upper, in my lower right hand corner um, that I can see the various wind speeds. Um, and that now the map and now open wind understands okay, this is the wind speed or this is the approximate wind speed. Um, now I happen to be at 30 meters. Remember, I selected four different hub heights. So I could also look at, well, what about if I built my wind turbines at 80 meters? Um, and then I can see uh, that I have significantly higher wind speeds. Um, while I'm here, I should also talk a little bit about the Met mask. So the Met mask is showing as um, it really only knows the wind speed at the very center, right where my cursor is. That's where the wind speed is. What we're looking at is called a wind rose. Remember, you have wind speed but your wind speed might be at different wind speeds at different directions, and you might have different wind speeds a different percentage of the time. The idea of the wind rose is it's giving you a visual representation of which direction most often has the highest wind speeds going in that direction. Um, and you have to be a little bit careful when reading these wind roses because the length of each sector might mean something different uh, depending on um, who made the wind rose. So you have to be a little bit careful. It's like, does this mean the wind is strongest in this direction or does this mean that the wind blows most of the time in this direction? Um, but as you can see, I can, um, I get a good visual representation and there is data inside my layer of how fast the wind speed is. Um, I'm gonna take this opportunity to also go in here and select properties and show you that on the color scale, Right now I'm showing banded colors if I'm more interested in kind of getting a more continuous map. I can see this as more uh, in blended. Um, and so it tries to uh, extrapolate or interpolate what the um, wind speed is between two data sets. Um, and then I can also go back to properties. I can change this back to banded. And if I want, 
I can um, cap these off. I'll set this to 13. I can change my number of steps to eight. Um, I can also go in here and I can actually change um, the color type. Uh, to get different different types of representations or different, uh, you know, uh, maybe in my brain, red means high wind speed and blue means low wind speed. I can select the different types of uh, um, color maps I'm using. Okay. Um, the other thing I can do is, so there's this other wind speed. I'm gonna select the second wind speed. And notice when I selected wind speed, um, this dialog or th this dropdown popped up. It wasn't there when I had a vegetation night because it didn't have in that information. But with wind speed, uh, I'm gonna get different maps for different hub heights, right? So I'm gonna have different concentrations of where, the, where there's high wind speed and where there's low wind speed and what is the high wind speed and what, what is low wind speed. If I select, this wind map instead of my the the, the lower one uh, just so it's all the same I'll select this set my lower lower limit to zero and uh, here I'm at oh we'll go ahead and we'll set this to 18 sure um, um, in addition to me being able to change the different hub heights, I can also look at the different wind directions. So what this slider is telling me, this is going from zero degrees to 360 degrees or 330 degrees uh, to show me what the various wind directions are. And you can see like the sector number. So this is sector one is from zero degrees. I imagine that's the wind speed coming from here to about here. Uh, and you can get a sense of which are the, what are the directions that have the highest wind speed? All right. So now finally, we're going to add a, a wind turbine to this, um, a wind turbine to our project and see like how much energy can we harvest from a, a wind turbine. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, add back our elevation plot and um, just some other plots so we get a better visual representation of where there's land and, and, and where there's height. Um, and all right, so we're going to follow these steps to add a turbine. First thing we're going to do is we're going to right click a layer and select new layer turbine layout. And I get this new layout layer. And with my edit tool selected, um, you would think I would left click to create a turbine, but to say, let's put a turbine here, but you right click. All right. So now I'm saying, all right, there's a turbine at that point. Let's say I put a, a wind turbine there at that point. Um, now, in this layout, um, the tutorial doesn't go into this yet, but to kind of jump ahead, because I think you kind of have to, um, if I go to properties here, I can select, um, by default, it doesn't have that many different types of turbines built in, but I can select uh, like the size of the turbine or, or of these you know, four typical types of turbine. And then remember, this is the educational version uh, if we got a license for the full version, there would be some more, there would be more uh, different types of turbines um, that we could select from. I'm going to select this generic five kilowatt for now. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm going to leave it for the default for now. All right. Um, oops. I seem to have lost my turbine. Oh, okay, there it is. All right. Um, all right. 
So I'm going to go ahead and follow these directions. I'm going to go to, I'm going to write, oh, I'm going to go to the operations menu. And with this new layout selected, I'm going to go to the operations menu and I'm going to select energy capture. I think that's what the directions tell me to do. And I get a warning message. Um, and this is one of the many times that this tutorial tells you to do something and then tells you, you get an error message and then it explains to you why you got that error message and what to do to fix that error message. Um, and the thing is, is that in order for it to calculate the energy that would be harvested from this wind turbine, it needs to, it needs to be in the same hierarchy as the wind map. So right now the new layout, it has the wind turbine information, but it doesn't know anything about the wind speed, uh, which is all in here in this new wind map. So what I need to do is I need to make this new layout a child, and I'm just gonna move it. It doesn't have to be up at top. I'm gonna make this new layout a child of my wind map, okay? And now that I've done that, if I go up to operations, I can select energy capture, and now it's going to give me a report. And what it's going to tell me is if I build a wind turbine at that location of that size, this wind turbine over a typical year will generate 16.3-ish gigawatt hours in a year. Okay, Remember a gigawatt hour or a kilowatt hour or a megawatt hour, these are units of energy. This is units of energy. And we buy and sell energy in terms of kilowatt hours, right? And like in the Seattle area, we probably pay about nine, 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, this is a gigawatt hour. This is a quite a bit of electricity. Um, it also tells us um, what would be the maximum electricity that could be generated if the wind was blowing at the rated wind speed for this wind turbine all the time. So that the wind turbine was constantly making um, was constantly making the maximum amount of energy it could. Um, that's never really gonna happen in the real world. Um, and so there's this phrase called capacity factor, which is um, essentially how much energy a wind turbine makes over the course of a tip of a year, divided by the amount of energy it could make over that year, during that year, if it was making the maximum amount of energy it was possible to make 24 seven for the entire year, that's the capacity factor. And so you get all of this information um, about this wind turbine uh, and about how much energy the wind turbine could make over the course of the year. Um, and then the tutorial, I'm not gonna go through the steps, but the tutorial goes through like, okay, let's move this. Um, and I can, by going back to edit and left clicking, I can move the, wind turbine to a different location, go up to operation, have it um, do an energy calculation. And, and, and you'll see now that I have a different amount of, um, you know, that my capacity factor has changed quite a bit. It's gone from like 63% to 42%. Um, and the amount of energy that I've created has been reduced, okay? Um, Oh, I should probably point out that you can also, um, I can open, like this looks like a spreadsheet. And if I want, I can open it up as a spreadsheet. I can open this up and I can save it in Excel and I can manipulate it or, or do whatever I want with the data in Excel, which is nice. I can also copy this information to clipboard um, and so forth. Um, I think that's a pretty good place for me to stop as far as this tutorial goes, as far as me getting you started. What I encourage you to do is we're almost done with the basic tutorial. What I encourage you guys to do on your own, because I've given you all the files for this, is to work your way through the uh, introductory and the basic tutorials, uh, which I've just essentially walked you through the big picture of. And then on your own, walk, go through this intermediate lesson as much as you can. 
What the intermediate lesson walks you through is I took you through designing a particular, you know, we only added one wind turbine. Uh, what we can do in the, and we learned to do in the intermediate lesson is, okay, let's select an area that we're going to have. We're going to build a wind farm in this specific area. Um, also, I want to dictate, I want to find what the optimal location for all of my wind turbines are. I want to be able to say, I want to find the placement of wind turbines that accounts for the fact that one wind turbine being in the wake of another wind turbine is um, going to reduce the amount of energy that that wind turbine can produce. I want to keep in mind that, uh, um, of course, that the wind changes direction so that a wind turbine in the wake of another wind turbine might be not in the wake of that wind, the first the upstream wind turbine if the wind direction changes. So taking into account what is the predominant wind's direction, uh, you know, this percentage of the time over the course of the year, given the fact that wind turbines being in the wake of other wind turbines reduces efficiency, um, what is the most optimal layout? What layout of wind turbines is going to create the maximum amount of overall energy for the year? And then I can do things like, oh, but wait, I also can't build a wind tur turbine on a steep slope. So rule out all the areas that have a very steep slope because I can't build a wind turbine um, in, a, in, in an elevation that's got a high gradient where we're rapidly changing from low out um, low elevation to high elevation. Oh, also, I can't build a wind turbine uh, within a certain distance from a road, or I can't build a wind turbine within a certain distance of a wetland for environmental reasons. Um, I need to make sure that my wind turbines are far away from dwellings. And you can add in all of those constraints. The intermediate tutorial teaches you how to do that. Um, and then you can um, learn how to come up with an optimal wind turbine layout based on all of these other various constraints that people who design wind farms are concerned with um, to, to come up with a plausible uh, wind farm layout that meets the criteria, in this case, this year for the competition, um, that also optimizes the amount of power that we can generate, okay? So I think that's, um, that's what you can do with open wind. And again, I encourage us to do this because I thought like uh, getting this, um, our feet wet with open wind uh, will help us learn other software like Furrow that does essentially something very similar to what open wind is designed to do. And I think Furrow, from what I can tell, operates a lot like, uh, operates a lot like open wind. Okay, so with that, um, uh, Garfield, unless you want to open up a question, unless you want to ask a question while I'm still doing the recording. No, this is going to be helpful for QGIS, um, at least for my part. I can't oh. run this program on my computer. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm going to hit stop record. Well, I guess first I have to hit stop share. And... Where's the stop recording? Oh, there it is.